Welcome to the Faded Spade Podcast with your hosts, Tom Wheaton and Sean McCormick. Welcome, everybody, back to the Faded Spade Podcast. My name is Tom Wheaton, founder and CEO of Faded Spade, and we are here with a tremendous next guest to talk about his business journey in our industry. He is a best-selling author. I think it's 14 or 15 time. We'll talk through that. He is the founder and CEO of PokerCoaching.com. He's a two-time World Poker Tour champ. I think he has like over $7 million in career tournament earnings, but we'll talk through all that. I am talking about Jonathan Little. How you doing, bro? Welcome to the Faded Spade Podcast, man. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Life is going as well as it can since we're all on lockdown, but we are making it through it. Dude, usually I butcher an intro like one or two times, so hopefully that was all right. But uh, you started pointing to the books behind you. I knew you were an author. I knew you were a best-selling author. I didn't realize it was that many until I checked it out beforehand, man. Yeah, I, I write a lot of books. I just finished one. Um, I, I finished it literally two days ago. It's called like Selling at Tough No Limit Hold'em Games. It's going to be a good one. It'll be out probably July or August, something like that. The printers are slow at the moment. Everything's slow at the moment for any physical item, but we're making it happen. There you go, man. All right, so we'll get into that. But before we jump into this whole business story of you, because you know, I know you're your poker journey is pretty well documented. Um, and I think, you know, the purpose of this podcast is to dive into the entrepreneurial journey for folks who are trying to achieve the same things in their life, whether it be in the industry, out of the industry, you name it. Um, but one thing that really like resonated with me is I had met you probably during tournament of champions a few years ago when we were just starting out with faded spade and I had just played in my first 10 K and we chatted for a little bit and I just remember you being so positive, um, just supportive about talking about what we were trying to do. And uh, that kind of resonated with me. And you've always been someone I wanted to have on to get to know a little bit more. So, so talk to us about when you started your business journey. Did it start around the same time as your poker journey or was it kind of an evolution for you, man? It was definitely an evolution. So I was a poker player who was just playing online sit and goes for the most part. And I was posting a lot in forums and people were helping me. And once I became a good sit and go player, I was one of the biggest winners in those games in 2003, 2004, back on party poker. And I was just always helping other people. And inevitably people wanted to come to me to get private coaching. So after coaching many students, I decided to work with a few other sit and go players and make a training site devoted to helping sit and go players. Yep. And so that was small. We were, you know, breaking even or even losing a little bit of money each month and we were fine with that. We didn't care. It was almost like a community service to some extent because yep. people helped us. And if people did not help us, we would certainly not be where we were. And um, that just sort of piddled around for a while. Sit and goes are not the most popular form of poker. And eventually sit and goes um, became very unprofitable whenever um, essentially party poker left the United States market because they don't want to be criminals. And that resulted in all the players playing on a few other sites. And essentially what happens is all the weaker players on party poker just stop playing, but all the good regulars continue playing. Yep. And that made the sit and goes very tough. So that happened when I was, I don't know, 22, 21, something like that. And then we had to transition to multi-table tournaments. So I transitioned to typical poker tournaments and Continue doing that. Um, I ran some iteration of my training site this entire time, always just paying people for content and losing money. And that was fine because again, I, I didn't really care because right. if I you know, lose 3000 bucks a month, it'll cost me 36 K a year and I'm helping out the community. Right. And that, that was all okay. So it was all like a slow, slow, just like a thing I was doing on the side for fun, right? It was essentially a hobby because I liked helping people and people liked learning from me. So it was a win-win. Did you start doing this before or after your WPT titles? I started that way before the WPT That's titles. That's what I thought. I, I had thought that. Yeah, I was, I mean, I must have been like 20 years old or something. So yeah. I haven't even played a live poker tournament before we had a, had a training site because I was one of the biggest winners in that particular form of poker. And you could make good money from that particular form of poker back in the day. I was playing something like 3,000 sit and goes a month at $200 to $1,000 buy-in with you know, a small return on investment, but a decent one, and that results in making like 30,000 bucks a month. 
And a lot of people were doing that back then, and I could teach people to do that, and it was not all that difficult. But it turns out games that are not all that difficult are easy for anyone to learn, and that results in the game dying eventually. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point. So, you know, you had mentioned that you had this passion for teaching. So even before, you know, you got into the poker world, did you have a passion for educating or teaching people, you know, when you were in school or just growing up? I don't think I ever have... I don't even know if I have a passion for educating people. I don't necessarily think that. Like, okay. I don't know if that is part of my thought process. I think of it more as I'm happy to help people who want to help themselves. Mm-hmm. And if I can consolidate the information that I've learned over you know, my many years of experience to help them not waste a lot of time, that's very valuable. I mean, I've wasted a ton of time reading poker books that were irrelevant or bad, and I want to make sure other people don't make many of the same mistakes that I do. Um, but no, like growing up, I never really thought I'm going to be a teacher or anything like that, but I was always actively learning. Anytime I wanted to learn anything, I would always study everything I possibly could. Like I was decent at chess as a kid, so I read a bunch of chess books. I was good at Magic the Gathering, so I read a bunch of Magic the Gathering books. And anything I wanted to get good at, I'd always study a ton, and I'm happy to be a resource for people who want to study poker a ton. were a thousand dollars or so whereas the biggest buy in live games were ten thousand dollars so i'd rather just play significantly bigger because i was bankrolled to play bigger and um, i've seen people playing on tv and they seem like they didn't know what they were doing so i'm like okay this is clearly good like i'm i'm playing against people who are way better and i'm still winning so let's go play live poker so when i was 21 i did that i did poorly my first year i lost like every tournament i played and then second year i did well i won wpt and continued running hot so that was lucky But I don't know if I ever necessarily thought I'm making some sort of giant transition to no longer teaching sit and goes. I I did at one point, we had a site and we changed the name of it. It was very sit and go centric. We changed it to be a bit more tournament centric. And that's because that's what most people were playing. Mm -hmm. And now I'm mainly trying to teach no limit Texas Hold'em, which encompasses cash games, tournaments, sit and go satellite. It's basically every form of no limit Mm Hold'em because I realized that I know these games better than most people, and um, I'm happy to do that. That said, I'm not teaching things that I do not know. What a lot of people do wrong, I think, is they try to teach everything. And, like, I know I'm not the best deuce to seven triple draw player, so there's no deuce to seven triple draw content on my site. Even though I've played it some, I'm probably better than 90% of the field, but that doesn't make me qualified to be a good coach that deserves you to pay me for my information. So yeah. we, we teach exactly what we know, and if I don't know something, I, I hire people who do know it if I, if I want to have that on the site. Oh, that's cool, man. All right. So take me back to, you were talking about, ah, we were losing like 3000 a month. If we lost 36 K for the year, whatever we were helping the community. I'm sure you had a ton of kind of business uh, ups and downs during that time. When did you in your mind say, okay, I am going to create this into a profitable business. Was that an intentional decision that you kind of just started acting towards or did it just kind of happen over time? How do you know we have a profitable business today? <laughs> I'm just going to say, I'm going to go ahead and guess. I'm going to go ahead no, and guess. No, we do have a profitable business today. So <laughs> eventually the two guys I was working with didn't want to continue losing a bunch of money each year. So they wanted me to essentially buy them out for a relatively small price, basically take it over. Okay. And I did. And I had just broken up with my fiance. This must have been 12 years ago. And I was oh, sitting wow. at the M Casino, degenerate gambling on sports and drinking alcohol. <laughs> and I decided to play a random $50 Ryan poker tournament there. It was a sad time in life. And um, I randomly met a guy in the tournament who had just graduated a few classes on marketing and was trying to find a poker player to partner with to help them market their content. He knew me from, like I already won a bunch of poker stuff and he knew I had a training site. So he came up to me and said, I would like you to make me a video of you just playing online for something like 10 hours and then I'll sell it. And then I give him some of the profits and I keep some of the profits. And I didn't think anything would come up, but I said, sure. So I went and I played online and I played 180 person sit and goes because I know I could play a bunch of games of those in a day and it simulates a tournament. It's like a 180 person tournament. I ended up winning something like $5,000 in that day playing $10 buy-in games. Like I just won every game I played. It was insane. So that was a good video. And we made that video and we sold a bunch of it in a very short period of time. I think we made, I don't even know, like $20,000 in the first month. And that was very good compared to losing 3,600 a month or whatever it ended up being. And 
that kind of kicked it off. So I found a good marketing partner. You definitely want to find partners to work with you who do things that you do not know how to do. Mm -hmm. That is vitally important. And I was a good poker player and perhaps a good poker educator, but I was like oblivious to the marketing side of things. Like all of our marketing we do is just purely, have you heard of me and my online poker playing? Mm -hmm. And if you know me, then you'll find me. But that was all I was doing. And um, this, this helped change that. He did some affiliate marketing. He, he made an email list and things started taking off after that. I think it's a good point, man. It's something I learned too. Like I spent time in the corporate world well before I started Faded Spade. And if I learned anything, whether it's when you're building a team or now building a business three and a half, four years later, you've got to bring people in or at least seek people out who have different strengths than you. Mm -hmm. And when you partner with those right people, you know, and you bring what you bring to the table as a strength and they bring to what they bring as a strength, you know, magic can kind of happen. And for, for us, it was a little different because marketing and business development was like our strength, but operations and understanding the business side of the poker industry was not, right? Because it was just being a rec player. So what advice would you have for people who were starting out business on their own? And they know like, hey, look, these are my strengths, right? But what advice would you have if there are areas of weakness? Um, what would you tell them to go do like right away in order to try and grow? I mean, you want to figure out why you are not succeeding. If you're not succeeding or if you are succeeding, then, you know, perhaps just keep doing what you're doing or look for areas where you are generally weak. But it's tough to say. I mean, that's a very, very broad question. <clears throat> but you want to purpose. try to figure out what you are bad at and then either learn it yourself or hire someone. And I've always been very lucky in that, like everyone who works for my company now found me. I did not find them. Oh, wow. And they came to me and said, I see you have this problem with your business. I'm really good at this. Let me help you. And a lot of them will just work for free for a while and mm -hmm. prove to me their value, which is very abnormal. Like I don't think I've ever actually had to actively hire someone. And that puts me in a very odd spot because I realize most people have to go out and find a partner. And it's hard to know who to partner with and who to work with. I mean, I've turned down working with a lot of people too, but you want to go find people who want to help you, who have the same vision as you, who can ideally compliment you and will work well with you. So Jonathan, that's pretty damn rare. Um, and I think it's a good lesson for anybody listening right now. Like if you have a skill set and it's a business or entrepreneur that you're passionate about and want to help, don't be afraid to take the initiative to go talk to them about it because you never know. You could wind up working with. Yeah, and, and really you just have to add I was going to say, you just have to add immense value to people. If you become the go-to person for whatever your skill set is or your industry is, some people will like you and some people will find you. And the internet currently makes that pretty easy. Like you can start a Twitter page, an Instagram page, and YouTube channel and make content and get out there. And maybe people won't take much notice at first. I mean, I've been doing this, what I say, 15 years or something at this point. Yeah. And it was very slow for the first 10 years. And that was okay. I didn't care because I wasn't doing it to make money. I was doing it because I enjoyed doing it. Just like playing poker at first. I didn't get into poker to purely make money. I got into poker because it was a fun game and I like playing poker. And I have been very fortunate in that my hobbies have become careers to some extent. And I mean, I would try to recommend that to everyone, but I realize at the same time, that's not how most businesses work because most things are not fun. Unless of course you view business as fun. I think business is fun and I've learned a lot about marketing since I've gotten into business. I've learned about all sorts of things relating to business that I enjoy learning. It's not really, it doesn't feel like work. Yeah. And I think that's a great point. I mean, when you're doing something you're passionate about, even when it has ups and downs, it still doesn't feel like going to a, a nine to five type job, man. So during this time when you were growing um, that business, how were you balancing playing poker and growing the business? I don't really have a great answer to that because essentially I would go and play poker tournaments. And when I wasn't playing poker tournaments, I'd be working on business stuff. Yeah. And again, for the longest period of time, the business was not it, like it took up 5% of my time or something like okay. a very negligible amount. It was basically me making some poker videos and putting them on the internet. <laughs> so like that takes exactly amount, the amount of time it takes me to make the poker videos. I do pretty much everything in one take. I think of what I'm going to do and I just do it and then it's done. And if I make, you know, whatever, 10 hours of content a month, it takes me literally 10 hours. And that's, you know, whatever it is, two hours a week, it's almost nothing. Yeah. So that, that was what I was doing for the longest time. And 
once I met my marketing partner, Dan, we started ramping up a little bit. I let him take control of the training site that essentially resulted in getting rid of all the people who were paying way too much money to make content mm -hmm. and working hard to market me and market the training site to some extent. And that just slowly grew and grew and grew. And I started playing a little bit less poker in exchange for doing things like writing books, making courses. And basically what I did is I would just start making a course on whatever my students were having big problems with. And I did that every month. I'd make a, something like a five hour or 10 hour long course on a specific topic. And then um, we would sell that to people who wanted to learn about that topic. And that's what we did for, you know, four or five years. And we, it, it worked out pretty well. Awesome, man. All right. So let's talk about that. Were you a writer before this at all? Or was like it a whole new venture for you to say, I'm going to write a book based on the feedback you were getting from your community? So I did not set out to write a book at all. Um, I was approached by Byron Jacobs of DNB Poker, which is now the biggest poker publishing company. And he basically said, I like your training videos and I think you could write a good book. And what I actually did for my students is every time a student would ask me a question, I would just write an article on it. And sometimes that'd be, you know, a paragraph. Sometimes it'd be 10 pages. And I just did it because I wanted to do it. I'd send it to them. And that way I don't have to answer the question again for anybody else. I just find the article and send it to them. Right. And so I actually had about 400 pages worth of articles on all sorts of topics pertaining to no limit old tournaments already done. So he said, can you write a book? I'm like, oh, probably. So I made an outline, plugged in all the articles, filled in the blanks. And it took like a week to write this 500 page book. And it was easy <laughs> because yeah. I already had done it. Yeah. So the book was essentially already finished um, whenever I was approached for it. And clearly it's good if your publisher asks you to write a big book and you make the book in a week and you're done with it. And so my writing was not the best back then. I'm, I've improved significantly since then because I've studied writing as well, right? I mean, I've studied everything I am doing, everything that's my responsibility. I've tried to get better at, but uh, the, the first book, Secrets of Professional Tournament Poker was well received. and I, I suppose it put me on the map as a poker author because back then there were a few books that really taught very tight, aggressive poker. And it turns out tight, aggressive poker works well when your opponents are oblivious, but mm -hmm. it doesn't work so great in tournaments if your opponents realize you're only putting money in with good hands. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the premise of the book was a lot of your opponents are either going to be bad or they're going to be tight and aggressive. So let's develop strategies that maximally exploit bad players and or tight, aggressive players. And that gave a lot of students a huge amount of success. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I remember I fall in that category. I was always just playing tag, 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 you know, two, five, no limit. And it was almost like ABC too. And when other players would have a different strategy than me, it would just completely mess up my game. And I've studied a little bit of your stuff. Um, and I, one thing I, I completely think that you've done a great job at is you seem to relate really, really well and teach really, really well, just the standard recreational player who's playing one, two, two, five. Was that, was that purposeful for your training or did that just kind of happen over time? I think it's always important to know who you are speaking to. Yeah. And the tough thing about making content on the internet is that you don't often know who you are directly speaking to, but it's become clear that most poker players who want to study poker some are usually gonna be motivated recreational poker players who are tired of losing or who are not having the win rate that they want. So I'm not out there trying to teach the top 10 poker players in the world how to get better right. because first off, there's only 10 of them. <laughs> and also like, I'm not going to help them much at all. I just realized that's not going to happen. So in terms of making a business, more business advice, make sure either the people who you are helping can either pay you a ton, which no poker is going to play. No poker players are going to be paying $10,000 for coaching or anything like that. Right or you want to be able to help a lot of people. And so I have you know, hundreds of thousands of followers on my email list who some of them don't pay anything, right? But they just enjoy the free content. And eventually if they have a win down the road and they want, or they want to start studying poker more, they will think of me first. And I'm gonna be the first person to have a shot at their business. So I do a whole lot of teaching people for free. And I'm happy to do it again. It goes back to just community service and doing good work and getting known because imagine all the content you make is behind a paywall. Well, now only people who already know you are going to be paying you. Um, so something you said there, Jonathan was uh, resonated with me because it was a big part of uh, our business and that was creating community. 
and that's creating value. Um, and I feel like you've done such a great job of that. You were mentioning your followers, but I don't think you get to build that type of community and that type of following unless you're adding value to people um, and not asking for anything in return a lot of the times. So I think what you said was really smart where it's like you built this community, you offered up this content for free. And then for those that wanted to take a, a step further, you had a way to monetize. So do you remember when you actually decided to start monetizing? this training type platform outside of just the personal coaching you did, you know, on the side, which I know you can charge a really high hourly rate for, but do you remember when you started trying to monetize the community in terms of the, the paid training? We always had training behind a paywall, um, even on the very, very first training site. Back then we weren't really making any content for free because YouTube didn't exist and Twitter didn't exist and Instagram didn't exist. None of that existed back then. Mm -hmm. So I suppose our free content was just stuff we would post on various forums. That's where poker players used to hang out back in the day. I remember. Now poker players hang out on YouTube and Twitter for the most part. Yep. But um, we did not actively have any like paid, or, or we didn't have any active free video content or anything like that back okay. then. I don't know when I decided that I'm going to start putting out stuff for free. It was probably just the obvious thing to do because Twitter came about and YouTube came about and Twitch came about. I actually got banned from Twitch for streaming poker. I was apparently the first person to try to stream poker on Twitch and they banned me. And then a year or two later, Jason Somerville came around and got famous for doing the exact <laughs> same thing that I did. So that oh, was fun. Wow. But I, I'm always trying to find where are the people, where is the attention? And if I am providing a helpful service, it's my job to help as many people as I can and get in front of those people wherever they are. And I realized poker might as well be a video game. And that's where a lot of people were hanging out. So um, I streamed on Twitch for a while after they unbanned me because they made poker fine. And um, like I started making YouTube content because that made logical sense, right? I mean, that's where people are hanging out and I would post stuff on my website. And I, I don't know if there was any conscious thought process of, okay, to get people to buy my thing, I need to give away free stuff. There was no thought like that mm -hmm. because again, it was almost just kind of me winging it and do whatever, doing whatever I thought made logical sense and what would help out people yep. as opposed to some like almost devious strategy of how do I trick these people? Yep. Because I think a lot of people who get into business especially if they are kind of like the um, you know, more shady educational people who are not actually helping. They're trying to think, how do I trap these people and get them to pay me? Mm -hmm. Whereas I don't really care if anybody pays me because I have plenty of money and I'm just doing this for fun anyway. Yep. And it's like, how do I just provide enough value and help people out? Yep. I love and, that. And like, I don't, I don't really care if I get paid and we, we have hundred percent money back guarantee on all of our products. And I make it really clear. If you don't like it, if I didn't help you here, then I don't deserve your money and I don't want your money. And that's very different than what a lot, a lot of other poker training sites do is they'll try to charge a ton of money for a product and it'll be six hours of content and they won't give you a refund if you don't like it and they don't update it. And it's like, eh. like I get they're actually trying to trap people because that's how they're making money. Whereas, you know, if, if you don't want to pay me, you don't have to pay me. And if you want to pay me, you can. And um, turns out if you add immense value, people will reward you. I love it. And I think that's a big part of your success. And I asked that question with purpose because a lot of our guests that we have on, um, and I think a lot of the people that watch for those business stories have a misconception. A lot of times I think people think that the folks who grow in their entrepreneurial endeavors have this master plan and they put together that plan for so long and they execute the plan. And a common theme among all of our guests in our industry or outside of our industry is that it was all about execution and action and just kind of figuring things out as they go. And you figure things out as they go and you make the best decisions you can and then you see what happens. Um, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs get trapped in, I need to have this rock solid business plan that has all these great strategies on how I'm going to acquire customers and this and that. And you could spend two years on that and not have a business. Or you could do what you did. You could do what we did. You could do what others did. And I'm sure both of our businesses still have a long way to go for whatever goals we have, but it's just start doing some kind of action, start making decisions, making things happen and figure things out along the way. There's nothing wrong with that, but that goes against the traditional business coaching from like the baby boomer, boomer generation. Would you agree with that statement or would you offer some other type of insight to folks? It depends on what the consequences are. So the consequence of my business failing would be, the time I've spent doing it because I did not have to invest any money making things, right? 
Like if I was going to make playing cards, for example, you have to make the playing cards that cost money. Right. And like initially when Dan came to me and said, make me this 10 hour video of you playing online, what is the worst that could happen there? Right? Like I could play 10 hours, lose money, make this video, it not sell. And I'm out, you know, 10 hours of my time and a thousand bucks. And is that detrimental? No, it doesn't matter at all, but it could turn into something great. If you are, let's say you decide you want to make poker tables, poker tables are expensive. And imagine you don't have a plan and you decide that, all right, I'm going to make a thousand poker tables because these are going to sell like hotcakes. And then you're stuck with a thousand poker tables that nobody wants and you have to put them somewhere. And that could be detrimental to your life. Right? Mm -hmm. So I definitely think when the stakes are low or the potential downside is low, yeah, you should just act and see what happens, you know, get out there and, and do things. But if the stakes are very high or potentially detrimental to your life, you, you should be way more cautious because the risk of a bad outcome is higher. Or even if the risk is not higher, if that bad outcome does occur, it's terrible for you. Whereas right. if I lost 10 hours of my time, like who cares? So um, I think the space that I'm in is very forgiving in, the, in terms of if you do something poorly, does it actually matter? Because like not everything I've made has been successful and some things I've done have, have done poorly. And that's fine. Like I, you know, we have 15 books behind me, but only, you know, six or eight of them have sold very well. And some of them have sold only okay. And that's fine. I don't care because all it cost me was some time. And the neat thing about publishing books and whatnot is that you don't actually print a ton of them. I don't have to print a hundred thousand of them at a time. And if they don't sell them in terrible shape, you know, you print a thousand and if a thousand sell good, print a thousand more. And like all of the digital content is relatively cheap to make. Um, it really depends on how you go about doing it, right? Like right now I'm, I'm paying someone to make an app for me and that's been really expensive, but that's because I'm outsourcing it. If I wanted to learn that and do it myself and take it slowly, it would cost me nothing. So it becomes a matter at some point of how much money do you want to be firing into something? And if you are willing to learn it yourself or partner with someone who does it purely off of a base of your profits, then it doesn't really cost you anything. It might cost you more down the road. Like my guy, Dan's made a ton of money and, uh, that's okay. Cause I don't mind. Cause he's added a ton of value. And if you add a lot of value, you, you do get rewarded. And he didn't come to me and say, you know, I want you to pay me a hundred bucks an hour to make this work. He was like, I'll do it for free, but I want a percentage of the profits. And that's cool. You know, if, if like, I, I was happy to do that because it made it completely no risk for me. It'd be yeah. like, if he came up to me and said, all right, I'll do this work for you. I'm going to charge you $10,000 to do this. And it'll be great. I'm sure it will be right. Like, well, am I just going to agree to a $10,000 bill right off the bat? The answer is probably not. But if it's a $0 bill, but a percentage of the profits, then I'm way more inclined to do it or at least consider doing it. Yeah. But, but nowadays, like I would be way more inclined to just pay the money because I'm in a different setup, right? Now we have the money to spend and I'm in a different situation in life. So when it comes to starting a business right off the bat, you want to ask, could this go very poorly? If it could, then be way more cautious doing it or figure out a way to mitigate the risk. Yeah. Love it. And, and that balance of planning and balance of execution, like you're not going to be able to get out of a book. It's just going to be going through it and you'll know, like you'll find out throughout your journey, you know, how much do I have to actually plan and how much do I have to just go and execute? Um, and I don't know about you, but, um, we've had to adapt our business tremendously during the last few months. Right. Um, and that adaption of business, you can't be afraid to pivot, you know, when you need to, do you recall a time in your growth as a business owner or with your business where you were heading down one direction and just had to completely pivot? Did anything like that ever happen to you? I don't know if I've ever had to completely pivot. I mean, in terms of like back in the day, I was teaching exactly sit and goes. Yeah. I realized sit and goes are dying. Yeah. And if I stay here, no one's going to be on my training site. Yeah. So <laughs> we had to move to the more popular game, which I was playing anyway, because I realized as a poker player, I need to get out of these sit and goes because they're dying. So when I essentially changed from one game to the other, sit and goes to tournaments, I kind of moved the training side that way because I'm just teaching what I'm doing and what I know yeah. as opposed to kind of like trying to teach what other people necessarily want. Yeah. I'm trying to teach what I already know and I'm giving good solid advice about it. Like people send me emails every day about wanting Paula Madomha coaching and stuff. And you know, I'm pretty good at the game, but I'm certainly not the best. So I send them to the people who are the best. Oh, that's cool. And like, that's okay. You know, you, you cannot be every, everything to everyone, but in terms of like a hard pivot, that was a, I suppose a bit of a pivot, but I'm still making educational poker products just about a different game. Yep. 
And um, eventually we realized that a lot of the poker training sites are kind of floundering that are just making videos of people playing poker online, mm -hmm. which is what all of us did for a long time. We would be us playing some poker online and talking about it. Mm -hmm. It's what every, every site did. And I realized basically every site is doing worse today than they, are, than they were in the past during the poker boom. So we need to change. So now our training site has live webinars where you can ask the coaches questions and send in your hands to get reviewed. We have a lot of quizzes that are very interactive that sort of force you to play a hand and get feedback in real time. And we have homework that's kind of tough. It's, it's in depth. It's like learning, learning, going to go, going to school. Right. Mm -hmm. And we have a bunch of courses that are very in depth about a very specific topic as opposed to essentially imagine like watching a Twitch stream where you watch someone play poker. You're going to pick up some stuff while you're watching it, but it's going to be completely random stuff and it's not going to be really drilled down and you have a hard time learning. And I want to make sure that people are actively learning and, I, I've learned how to help people learn better as I've been on this journey of teaching people stuff. Well, let's talk about that journey, right? So thinking about when you started the business, right, to where you guys are now, right? And I made the assumption that you were a profitable business and I'm glad it was a correct assumption. Yes. But thinking about it, you know, now where, where you are as a business owner now, where pokercoaching.com is now as a business compared to when you started. And this is something that puts people on the spot. Um, what is something like, like you really learned about yourself that you might not have known about yourself when you started the journey? I don't know. I'm not the most um, self-reflective person. I wish I was. Mm -hmm. I typically am more busy doing the work than mm -hmm. thinking, which is not necessarily ideal. That's why I have um, my partner, Dan, who does a lot more thinking. <laughs> I mean, I basically outsource everything of my business besides exactly the content creation. Like that is my job because that is exactly what I'm good at. And maybe that's what I've learned is that I'm only good at creating content. I'm not so good at running the business and I'm not so good at marketing. And to be fair, I've tried to learn these things as I've gone along because it's important to know what to do in case, you know, Dan decided to leave or he died tomorrow or something, right? Like I needed to be able to take over just in case. Right. But um, I, I think that's, I guess that's what I've learned is I've learned that I need to lean on other people who know much more than I do about all sorts of things. Okay, there you go. I like that. And hey, that's something that I've had to learn about myself too, man. Like the operational production type stuff compared to the business development and the marketing. I got to find somebody else to help me with that shit, right? Yeah. <laughs> so well, I mean, like I've also learned that the same thing applies to most people. Like, um, yeah. for example, Dan was doing all of the website design. He's fine at website design, but he's not the best in the world at it. So eventually, whenever his role becomes too overwhelming for him, I need to find people to help him, right? And right. when my role becomes too overwhelming for me, I found someone to help me because I don't make all of the PowerPoints anymore, for example. Yeah. I can, but there are other people who can do that as well. And if my job is to be the face of the company and make the content and do interviews and write books, like things that pretty much only I can do, anything that, I, that other people could do equally well or perhaps even better, I should let them do that. There you go. I think a lot of business owners sometimes get in their own way um, in terms of growth and they try to do it all. And I commend you, man, on learning that very quickly and then getting the right people in place to scale your business because I've been guilty of this, man. I've been guilty of trying to do it all myself with one or two other people. And that can sometimes help or that can hurt your growth when you do that. And it seems like that's a journey. That's, that's something you've learned from your journey and a good piece of advice for anybody listening and watching this right now. So I want to, I want to kind of correlate something you said to poker, right? So we're talking about right now, how to accentuate your strengths, focus on what you're good at while running a business, try and find help from folks who have the strengths you don't have, right? How do you translate that to a poker table for people when some people have very natural strengths and then very glaring leaks and weaknesses? What type of approach do you have for those people in terms of diminishing their weaknesses, but accentuating their strengths? It's tough because poker requires you to have specific strengths. And if yeah. you do not, you're probably just not going to be a good winning poker player. Whereas I'm not so sure that's true with something like business because there are all sorts of businesses and all sorts of roles that you can have in business. I mean, I guess in theory, you could say that if you're you know, not a good poker player, you could become a poker dealer or a tournament director or something. But that's, I'm not really thinking about it like that. I'm thinking if you, in poker, let's say 
you just always call on the river because you can't help yourself. Like, <laughs> okay, you're probably not going to win. Right. I hate to break it to you. So you have to work and learn to play good, fundamentally sound poker. That's just something that is required. Whereas in business, let's say you don't know anything about math. You can still be great at business if you hire someone who's good at math right. to, to handle your finances and whatnot. So I'm not too sure the two are related in that, related all that much in that, in that way, except for like in poker, you can hire people to help you learn other things. I mean, I've, every time I go to learn a new game, like when I wanted to go learn Palomidoma, I hired a coach and I'm going to play a lot of heads up poker because you need to be good at heads up poker to win poker tournaments at the end. I hired a coach. So I've hired a bunch of coaches to help me throughout my career because I realize it's just an absolute value. If I can pay someone any hourly rate really to give me all of the knowledge that I need to succeed in a short period of time, that's just very, very valuable. And so like in business, you hire people to help you. I mean, I've hired people to help me learn to teach better because I'm not the best teacher. I, I recognize this and I can always be better. I'm working on a big tournament course right now that's that never would be nearly as good as it is going to be unless I had someone reviewing it who is a world-class teacher. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that costs money, it costs resources, but I think it's going to be worth it at the end of the day. And, and it's tough because I realize a lot of people don't have the resources to spend. So if you don't have the resources to spend, just start doing it. Ask your friends for their input, right? Very important to get feedback about what you're doing because, again, imagine you made a bunch of poker tables and you thought it was the coolest thing ever, but everybody else thought it looked ugly or was no good or whatever. That's a big, big problem. So you want to get feedback, but at the same time, you have to be able to make good use of the feedback because everyone's not going to like everything you do. Like someone we showed the videos to said that, oh, they hate my background back here. It's cluttered full of trophies. I can't focus. Okay. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. I'm not sure. Um, is that something I should do? Should I get rid of my background? Because one person said that it was crazy. Interestingly enough, everybody else said, oh, I think the background is cool. Yeah. So like stuff that you don't even think about, right? Like I'm just trying to make a neat thing to display my, my stuff. Yeah. Some people may think it's distracting and a turnoff yeah. or some people may not like the way you talk or some people may not like all these other things that may not matter. So you want to figure out what actually matters and focus on that. But if everyone hates what you're doing, then it might be a problem. Like we recently made a change to the quizzes page on pokercoaching.com and we got a bunch of negative feedback because it turns out we removed a feature that a lot of people like that I didn't think was all that relevant. Yep. And good, you know, I, I got feedback. I should have tested it before. Clearly. Right. So since then, we've implemented a testing process where we get feedback about changes we're going to make before we make them. But, you know, we learn. We learn and um, we, make, we make changes accordingly and just continuously try to better everything. That's awesome. I love what you said about correlating hiring people in business to potentially hiring someone to improve your poker game because there is that correlation. I agree you can't compare the two completely. But one thing poker training has always done for me is it's helped me identify my strengths. Mm -hmm. It's helped me identify my weaknesses. And then it's helped me either turn some of those weaknesses into strengths or just know that they're there mentally to account for them. Right. And I think that's one of the most important. Sorry to hear things. my kids yelling. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no. It's real life right now. Coronavirus time. That's all good. My, my kids were just in the hallway. So they're definitely on the mic, man. <laughs> <laughs> so like, I kind of think that's really important because a lot of, I think about business or poker is self-awareness and, and I know poker coaching as a, as a player has helped me tremendously, like huge things like overplaying middling pocket pairs from certain positions, right? Like it took a coach to help me understand that was a weakness, right? Um, so I can relate to that hundred percent. And I think the other thing you said was about listening to your, your customers and your community, right? And there is a balance of what is the noise, that you just have to kind of ignore, like understand it's there, but it's noise. And then you have to understand like, what is this true feedback that you need to make some significant changes to your approach, whether it's content or business or et cetera. Your example was, you know, the setup in the back, which is a great setup, right? Um, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, <laughs> depends on the person. But there's, and I think this is, there's subjective opinions and there's objective opinions, right? And it's like, you gotta understand what's, what the objective ones or the subjective ones. Funny story for us is like our card backs. A lot of players were like, we love the card backs. They're great for security. Like it's this or that. A lot of casinos said the same thing. And then there's one person that said it gave them vertigo. Okay. You know, it's like, are we going to go change all the card backs because of that one point of feedback? But I think, you know, something to take away from what you said, Jonathan, to those listening or watching, thinking about, you know, 
feedback from their community or customer base is when you hear something is um, agreed upon by a large base of people, you got to take it into consideration and try to make the changes to keep your customers happy, right? Well, so that said, you have to figure out which group of people really care about specific things. For example, if all of your high paying customers don't care about something, but all of the people who don't pay you care about it, maybe you don't cater to them to some extent. Mm -hmm. And so you have to figure out what you're trying to accomplish. And if your goal is to make money, you need to make the people who are paying you money happy. Um, for example, the people who are paying us money said that they wanted to see the game theory optimal solution into every homework question. I, I didn't think it was that big of a deal because I'm trying to teach how to maximally exploit your opponents. Yeah. Um, but, you know, sure. Hey, if 20% if, if of the people tell me they would appreciate this and it takes me no time at all to do it, might as well throw it in there and then, you know, compare and contrast. But you want to make sure you're not listening to the people that don't actually matter to you. And as you are doing things that are more and more like out there, you're going to inevitably get haters and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm kind of fortunate that I don't have very many because I'm not doing anything too absurd. Mm -hmm. But I mean, like, like I'm sure whenever you change the way poker cards look, some people aren't going to like it. Mm -hmm. Like I remember when the world series of poker put the little sideways card image on the, on the corner, everybody hated it. Mm -hmm. And People were like, what in the world are you doing? Get these cards out of here. And they were pretty slow to remove them. Probably because they paid a bunch of money to get these cards made. They didn't have any other cards. <laughs> right. And that actually matters. But at the same time, you, you just want to ask whose opinion actually matters for exactly what I am doing. For example, if non-poker players didn't like your cards, who cares? Right. But if poker players who are playing every tournament really don't like your cards, right. then you, know, you should probably change something. You're right. 100%. And we, I remember when we did that, I remember when we first debuted the cards during Tournament of Champions, there was a lot of subjective, subjective and a lot of objective feedback, right? And one of the points was, hey, the middle pips are too small. We heard that from everybody. You know what we did? We increased them, right? Some people were like, ah, I don't like the J. Okay, right? <laughs> but so it's like, you gotta, you gotta figure out what's really gonna hit home for the people that you care about most. I think that is tremendous feedback. It's not even something I was really considering uh, when asking the question. So uh, great insight from Jonathan Little, the founder and CEO of PokerCoaching.com, best-selling author, you name it. What has this guy not done in the industry right now? Two-time champ, et cetera. So, you know, Jonathan, I know we only have uh, 10 or 15 minutes remaining on our time together. I want to be respectful of your time, but I think this story you're telling about your journey is like really purposeful for our listeners. So when we talk about co PokerCoaching.com now, right? Um, What's your purpose with it? What, what do you really want it to be? What value do you want your customers to be getting out of it right now? And how can they get involved with pokercoaching.com? Well, so this may not be a good answer, but it goes back to me perhaps not being so self-reflective and having time to sit down and think about these things. What am I trying to do though? I'm trying to make good content that helps people get better who want to devote time to their poker game, yep. right? And so... Again, I don't have some sort of grand plan when it comes to this. I'm just continuously trying to produce good content. And I'm also trying to hire the people to teach for me who I want to be learning from. Yep. So I've gone out and I've hired lots of really, really good poker players recently. It's costing me a ton of money, but I don't care because it's like I'm paying for the private coaching myself and sharing it <laughs> with everybody else in turn. So, I mean, like, what, what am I trying to do? I'm just trying to help people get better at cards. <laughs> I, love I love it. And, 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 and like, how can people get involved? You just go to pokercoaching.com, sign up for a free trial and go through the trial content we have there. Or you can just sign up for a premium membership. And if you don't like it, ask for a refund and I'll give you a refund. And I'm glad you said that because it can be that simple. It can be that simple. It's like, hey, the purpose of my business is to help people get better at poker. Boom. And I just want to continue <laughs> doing that, right? The purpose of our business is to disrupt the card industry and make sure poker players have a really quality product that they can actually enjoy playing with, right? Like it's not that difficult of a, of a thing to explain. So I think that's really cool that you're able to put it in those words. Um, you mentioned that you just finished a book. So do you want to tell everybody about that book you finished? It's called Excelling at Tough No Limit Hold'em Games. It is not available yet. It'll be available on dnbpoker.com probably pretty soon. Um, it's a good book. It's a big book. It's about... 400 something pages long, featuring content from a lot of the best online players in the world. I realized about five years ago that I was kind of getting behind. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so 
I became an advisor for a poker backing site called Pokar. Mm -hmm. They back a lot of people and they have a private training site for the backies. Okay. Essentially, they back mostly small stakes players, but some of them rise up to the top. And they've had a few players who have been number one player in the world online that have come from, you know, playing $10 buying games a few years ago. Now they're the number one player. And that's interesting. They're essentially teaching people to get better at poker, right? And um, I can learn a lot from that. So I became an advisor to them to help them with a lot of the live poker backing stuff. And I studied a lot from their training site and I learned a ton. Um, so I presented the idea to them. I was, I'm going to talk to your coaches, use some of their content here to make a book out of it. And it's become, it's become pretty good. I, I work with them a lot though. There's a book called Modern Poker Theory. Where is it? It's right down here somewhere. There it is behind my, oh, you can't see it. I, it there's a book called Modern <laughs> Poker Theory yeah. that, that purely became out of this relationship too. They have the Game Theory Optimal expert, Michael Acevedo, who, like I loved his content. I learned a ton. And like, we, I have to have this guy write a book. So I had him write a book. It was a big project for me because English is not his native language. He can speak English fine, but oh, wow. it required a bunch of editing, but I didn't mind doing it. Like that took, I don't even know, 500 hours of my time. And I didn't make any money off of it, but it was just like purely, again, community service to help people. And now he makes content for poker coaching, right? So it's like all this stuff kind of comes around. You help people out, you benefit the poker world and people are in turn happy to help you. But um, that's, that's how that book came about is I realized I need to learn from the best poker, play, poker players in the world. And I did it, found a way to do it, right? Without having to become a backy of the poker site. <laughs> there you go. And, and I couldn't agree with you more, man. <laughs> I mean, our industry, and you know, I've worked in three or four other industries in my corporate career before embarking on Faded Spade. And the poker industry is one of the most passionate industries you could be in. Um, whether it's just as a, as a player or from a business standpoint, because it's true. If you do right by people, you get the support from people. There are so many people that support our brand and I've never even, never even asked me for a dime that I never thought would. And I hope it's because they just see we're trying to improve certain elements of the industry and tell the story of an industry in a different way, even in some lights. So that is so true, uh, Jonathan. Uh, couldn't agree with it more, man. So any books that you've written that just stick out as like, oh man, this is my favorite book. And it's like, it was so satisfying to write. And... Two. Okay. Selling at No Limit Hold'em, as you see. This is what the next one's going to look like, kind of similar. Okay. This is a book with a lot of the best poker players in the world. We have yeah. Phil Helmuth at the top, Mike Sexton, Olivia Bousquet, Chris Moneymaker. Who else do we have? Scott Clements. We have a lot of good people in this book. Okay. And they all wrote a chapter. You can see the chapters down the way here. It's cool. Each, each line is a chapter. And um, this was a good one. This, is, this was inspired by the fact that I realized I get to travel around to these big poker tournaments, have lunch with all these people, and just <laughs> talk about poker. And a lot of them are very, very good at specific things. And so I had each of them write a chapter for me. That became a very good book, a very popular book. And this one, Mastering Small Stakes, No Limit Hold'em. Yes. Perhaps titled slightly incorrectly, because really it's about range analysis, but a book called range analysis would probably not sell very well. So <laughs> we discuss how to use ranges, as you see, there's a lot of, lot of range images in this book, to understand how to play fundamentally sound poker and how to narrow ranges based on your opponent's actions. And that book's almost a prerequisite to be able to do the homework at pokercoaching.com because we're really just doing a lot of range analysis based on how would you play in a fundamentally sound way and then how would you adjust it based on whatever your opponent's doing incorrectly so that book teaches you how to play poker well so that you know what to do in most scenarios and if you can pick the best option or the second best option in most scenarios you're gonna be better than most people you play against i'm so glad you said that because the range analysis and whatnot entire strategy of poker i think is something that a lot of recreational players don't even take into account and then when they do like through that book, which is my most known book of yours, um, it just opens up an entire world of uh, opportunity for you um, to expand your game and just, like you said, fundamentals, right? And I will say, if that is the book you're recommending for people, which I, I know it wasn't a recommendation, it was just something you're most proud of, but when it comes to ranges and understanding ranges in different situations, I feel like there's such a core component to poker strategy. 
Yeah. Um, I don't know if you want to get good at poker, get this book. That's Mastering the small six and eleven hold'em. And the thing is, a lot of people out there are trying to teach very game theory optimal strategies, but they're not implementable. Right. It's very important to learn to implement these strategies at the table because humans right. are really bad at making one play 62% of the time, the other play right. 18% of the time, and the other play the rest of the time. It's hard right. to do that. Right. No. But we teach how to break down the ranges, organize ranges, and then play them in a logical way based on a few parameters. So. Love it. Anyway, that's that. That's a good book. <laughs> that's the book if you want to get good at poker. Speaking of kids. Okay. <laughs> you can't see them on camera, but there they were. <laughs> yeah, there they were. <laughs> um, okay, so my, my wife came in and uh, my son came in. I should have I should have brought him on camera to say hello. You could have brought your kids in. We'd all say hello. So, um, all right, man. So as as we get down to uh, kind of the conclusion of our talk, um, honestly, Jonathan, some of the insight that you're sharing with me is has been insightful for me as I grow my business as well, uh, big time. Um, how have you balanced, and I'm asking this because a lot of our viewers um, kind of fit this demographic. So owning your own business, growing your own business, also being a poker player, right? How have you balanced all that with also balancing how to be a good dad or a good husband from a family perspective? How has that kind of growth process been for you in terms of achieving that balance? So essentially I have a pretty reasonable schedule and well, I'll, I'll tell you the, the virus schedule and the non-virus schedule. So when there's a virus right now, what we're doing is Monday and Tuesday, I'm fortunate enough to have my wife's dad. He comes over and watches the kids. So Monday and Tuesday, I basically can work as much as I want, but I typically only work from 9 a.m. until 6 p.m. And in those hours, I'm grinding hard. So 9 a.m. till 6 p.m., I am doing my best to record whatever I can whenever the kids are out of the house or when they're sleeping or whatever. So Monday and Tuesday are very hard work days. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, my wife is working. She's, what is she? A vi senior vice president of tax at GE Capital. So a, a good legitimate job. And she's working, um, well, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I basically am doing no work at the moment. I'm taking care of the kids. Um, Saturday, my wife tends to watch the kids for me. So Saturday is another work day if I need it. And then Sunday, I'm playing online poker for the second half of the day. The first half of the day, I'm hanging out with the family. Okay. So that results in me being able to hang out with the kids Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, usually Saturday and half a Sunday. And they're all respectful of that. They, they get that, okay, daddy's working, leave daddy alone. Or mommy's working, leave mommy alone. And it's just okay. You have to have boundaries and, and whatnot. But I make a point to wake up at like 6 a.m. and hang out with the kids every day from 6 until 9. So there's three hours there. We always um, hang out from like 6 p.m. until they go to bed at like 7.30, so there's an hour and a half there. And you do what you can within reason. Um, but I don't feel like any guilt for working or whatnot because I realize I'm also spending time with the family. I do my best to be as present as I can with them. It doesn't always happen because, you know, stuff catches on fire and you have to deal with it. But for the most part, I, I have a pretty solid routine. Now, when there is no virus. Um, Monday to Friday, we have a nanny from 9 a.m. till 6 p.m. So I'm just working hard 9 a.m. till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday. Um, Saturday and Sunday, I'll hang out with the family the entire time. And on Monday to Friday, I'm, I'm hanging out with the kids in the morning and the nights as well. And I'll also like pop out there and say hi every two hours or something, you know, and hang out for a few minutes. And then what I'll do pertaining to poker is I'll, at least currently, I would play poker about one week per month, roughly, maybe a little bit less. So I would find big, high volume tournament series to go play that I thought would provide a good expected return for that series. So I would not go and just play like a random tournament that would take two days. I would go and I'd play for a week, but play 20 tournaments in that time period or 15 oh, wow. tournaments. And I would try to go somewhere where I could play online on the main sites like Party Poker and Poker Stars. So usually I'd be to Europe somewhere or the Bahamas or something like that. And I would try to play a ton of poker in that time period. And while I would do that, I would usually not work on the business much at all beyond checking emails and staying in touch with my team. And so during my time at home, I'm getting very far ahead. I've been actually pretty lucky right now. Um, I actually had most of my routine content made up until I think September. Mm -hmm. So I make a weekly podcast. That's all done until September. Mm -hmm. I have articles I write and I do a lot of routine things. And I, I knew the World Series of Poker was going to come from you know, mid-May till the end of July. Yeah. So I already had all that content done because when I'm playing poker, I really don't want to have to wake up and write an article or wake up and right. make a video or something. I don't want to have to do anything. So I get very far ahead on most routine work. 
So even though I've only had like two really good solid recording days to make content each week, um, I haven't had to do the routine stuff because I was already very far ahead of that. Yeah. I'm like the anti-procrastinator. Something needs to get done, I just do it. <laughs> good. I mean, that really is probably the best advice for businesses. Do the work. Do it. You got to do, do the work and be happy about doing the work. Don't dread the work. Like today, I wanted to wake up and record some of this new course I'm making. I wanted to, right? So I roll out of bed and do it because I want to do it. Yeah. It's not, it's not a, something like, oh man, I have to go to work. Like I've literally never felt that towards this business. And I think that's perhaps, perhaps uh, lucky, but um, maybe there's also some skill involved in that of picking a business that you enjoy and also being rewarded by lots of people telling you they love your work. Yeah. I mean, it's a choice, right? So it's like, if you're choosing to get into your own business, make sure it's something you're passionate about. And, and even if it's three or four years later and that passion changes and it feels too much like work, then reassess, right? Um, if, you're, if you're doing the thing that you truly love, um, because that's, that's just so important. I think you are very blessed in that regard. I've been very blessed in that regard the last few years. Uh, I love the structure you have set up for your family. I need to, to implement more of that here. We had a structure during the distance learning. Um, it was pretty similar. And now that school is kind of coming to an end, my wife and I, who also, we both work from home, we're like, oh no, now what? So I think it's really important that you have that constant communication. You have that plan with your spouse of who's going to handle what with the kids. And you know what? I think it's okay. And I think it's good for, for kids to understand boundaries. And I don't know if you've experienced this in your life, but my kids will like, they see what my wife is doing and I'm doing it. And they come to us with all these really funny business ideas. And like, I want to run this toy company or this slime company. And we talk about it. And it's like, that's something that I don't know. I, I sometimes tend to feel guilt. Like maybe I'm not spending enough time, et cetera, which I think all parents probably feel that way. Um, but that's also a benefit of, I think, running your own business is have that structure to make sure you're present. Obviously make sure it's not running your entire life, but you never know how it's impacting your kids or your family in yeah, a positive it's, um, way. It's interesting. You never really know, but I, I would tell you to try to not feel guilt for the decisions you make right. in general, in all aspects of life. Make a decision, realize I'm going to make the best decision I possibly can. Every decision you make gives to something and takes away from something else. Yeah. But that's okay because you got to pay the bills, right? Everybody has to pay the bills and that's going to result in you not being able to spend all the time with your kids. And to be fair, it's probably good for your kids not to spend all the time with you. <laughs> right. And don't feel bad about things. Like, um, like my wife feels bad about having to work all day, you know, <laughs> stuck in the room with the kids outside playing with me. Yeah. And she feels bad, I think. But like, I don't feel bad about much of anything because I'm making a point to just do the best I possibly can. And I realize I'm doing the best I can. So why? When I feel bad about that. It's like when you play a poker tournament and you lose, even if, like if you play well, why would you feel bad if you lose, if you played well, because you lost money. Like you should know ahead of time, you're going to lose the tournament 80% of the time. Yeah. So it's going to, you're usually going to lose. Why would you feel bad about signing up for something where you know the expected outcome mm -hmm. and that's okay. I mean, it's a little bit different with parenting because you don't know, like if you spend an extra hour each day with your kids, maybe they become the best kid ever. If you didn't spend the hour, maybe they become a horrible kid. Who knows? You never really know the outcome, but all I can do is do the best that you can and make good logical decisions and be happy with your decision. And if you're not happy with your decision, figure out a way to change your decision. Man, um, I know you're a podcast host as well. You know, for me, this is something I'm doing for fun, right? No real professional training. So uh, why don't you share with folks, you know, about your podcast, where they can find it. So I have a podcast called the Poker Coaching Podcast, and currently it is a, a wide variety of content. So Initially, we had a podcast called Weekly Poker Hand, where every, every week I would just go through a poker hand, fun poker hand that either I played, somebody else played, and we would analyze it. It'd be about 10 minutes long, nothing too uh, fancy, but people enjoyed it. Then I decided to make a morning show called A Little Coffee, where Monday, Wednesday, Friday for 9 a.m., from 9 a.m. till 10 a.m., I'll get online and do kind of like this. Well, I'll, I'll just talk about a topic. I usually have a topic that the viewers ask me to speak about. I have a list of 100 topics to go through at some point. And I'll just talk to my fans for like an hour, three times a week. So that becomes part of that podcast feed as well. I have a show called Little Poker Advice. It's a one minute long clip of poker advice. I started just doing it myself. Then I realized uh, my kids want to be in it. So they'll, <laughs> I'll give them life advice that is veiled as poker advice. So that's fun. We do that. I'll do interviews. I'll interview people like, like what you're doing here. Sometimes we have things very similar to this on there. 
So there, there's a lot of different types of content there. It's called the Poker Coaching Podcast. Um, you can also get a lot of content at YouTube at pokercoaching. No, where is it? YouTube.com slash pokercoaching. Cool, man. Um, there we have tons and tons of videos. We're uploading three or four videos a week, if not more. And um, again, the content is, is varied. It's sometimes interviews, sometimes a presentation on a specific topics. Sometimes it's, um, well, it's all sorts of stuff. Got it. All right, good deal. And then you mentioned an app earlier. Is that something you want to talk about in terms of developing an app? It's been a big pain. Um, <laughs> it's called the Poker Coaching. It's, I think if you just look up Poker Coaching on iTunes or Android App Store, it'll come right up. It is not fully finished yet. We are releasing it piecemeal because it turns out if you wait until it's completely done, it'll never be done and it'll never be released. Great, great. So nice. I would guess, so get that. Currently it has our quizzes from pokercoaching.com there. And it also has a push fold app that is very easy to use at the table. The problem with a lot of push fold apps that are out there is that you can't really use them quickly, but ours, you can just press one button. It moves you to the next hand. It adjusts your stack size. You can say, if you steal the blinds, it'll increase your stack by a few big blinds and tell you what to do. Um, so anyway, that's there. Push fold apps free. The quizzes, some of them are free. Some of them are if you're a poker coaching member. And we're going to continue building that out with um, in-depth pre-flop ranges coming up very soon. Also, the classes from poker coaching will be available on that very soon. So it's a work in progress, but uh, we'll, we'll get there eventually. There you go, man. All right, so let's wrap this whole thing up. I'm going to put you on the spot because I know how much you love being put on the spot. <laughs> and sure. You uh, mentioned that uh, I know you don't think through through some of these things as as routinely as you'd like, but uh, I always kind of wrap up these discussions with, you've been on this business journey, you've been on this poker journey, there are other people who are trying to start their business or, or they're on their journey. Um, if you could give any one singular piece of advice to those people who are on their business journey, based on what you've learned during your journey, what would that be? Well, I already mentioned earlier is to just do the work, do the work, do the work and do good work. Be happy with what you're putting out, but actually put stuff out kind of like the app, right? I could have waited forever until I have this great app. But then the problem with that is I put out this app and maybe nobody likes it. Then I spent a hundred thousand dollars on something nobody likes. Yeah. I mean, does that, does that make logical sense? No, you want to make sure people are at least liking what you're putting out and they're getting value from it. So do the work and, and make sure the work is good. But at the same time, don't be a super perfectionist to the point that you never put out anything. I mean, I'll tell you, whenever I was writing this book here with all these authors, about half the authors, I said, write me a 20 page article on this and they did, no problem. Half of them turned it in in a week. The other half of them were super perfectionist and some of them I had to get up and go to their house and help them write it. <laughs> and I thought that book would take like two months to make because how hard is it to write 20 pages? Um, cause for me, it, you know, it would take a day, but apparently I realized like, okay, it'll give them a few months. I'll get it done. But it actually took about a year and a half. And that's because some people are super perfectionist and that results in them never actually putting out anything. And if you don't put out anything, if you don't make anything, then, well, you don't have much of a business. So you need to make something and you need to do it. And you got, you have to do the work, do the work. That's how we are going to wrap up this faded spade podcast with Jonathan little, be sure to get out. Uh, be sure to go to pokercoaching.com. Check out all Jonathan's content, the free content, of course, the paid content. Uh, Jonathan, you know, for someone that uh, has been a recreational player for a long time, who has now transitioned into the business side of the industry and working on his game, um, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. I think you are one of the really great people for our industry. And uh, to any viewer and listener of the podcast, uh, if you're looking for someone who is genuine and authentic, uh, and can teach you a heck of a lot of great things about poker. Uh, look no further than pokercoaching.com and Jonathan Little. Thank you, man, for spending the time with me and, and for spending the time talking about business, buddy. Thanks for having me. Keep up the great work. <laughs>